comes to shall be a different story. Amen. That's the voice we need to listen to. Amen. Hallelujah. Children class, you are dismissed. Children class, you are dismissed. Amen. Children class, you are dismissed. We serve a mighty God. He is so good. How many know we serve a good God? He is so awesome. You know, uh, when we think about uh, the blessings that God has given to us, we think about the things that God has done for us. I mean, we really are unworthy to receive anything. And we are deserving of death, but yet God's grace, God's grace, amen? Turn to someone and say, God's grace. God's grace. His grace is so awesome. His, just to, to understand God's grace, to understand how much God loves us, to understand how much His mercy endures forever. Amen? Mercy. Mercy is, is punishment held back. God's punishment held back. And who is that for? For us. God's given us mercy. For us. For us. Amen? Turn your Bibles to Matthew, Matthew chapter 16, Matthew chapter 16, and while you're turning to that, will you repeat after me, I am a child of God, I'm a saint of God, and I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me, and I know that I know that all things, not some things, not part of things, but all things works together for good. To those who love God, that's me. Turn to me and say, that's me. Turn to me and say, turn to your neighbor and say, that's you. That's you. I pity the fool who don't believe that. It's you. Amen. I like this. See, I can now walk back and forth. I can tap dance a little bit. Uh, the purpose was we're, gonna, we're thinking about taking the chairs and move them up just a little bit. One more aisle here. And that's what we're going to do, planned. But we'll see what God's going to do because he's got awesome things to do. nonetheless all right so uh we have uh the super bowl going out there and and we have thousands of people i don't know how many are in the, are going to be in the stadium like over fifty thousand, right right one million out of from out of town so like imagine and i mean the place is packed and we're preaching the gospel you know we're talking about the good things of god and the awesome things that, and there's all kinds of preachers out there there's some of the like, you know, like, eh, you got to stay out. No, I don't know. You're going to come in here. I'm not sure. You know, there's a, you know, but there's some awesome, you know, people who are, who just understand the grace of God. They understand the mercy of God. They understand that, that it's the, it's his awesomeness, his, who God is and what he can do for you and deliver you from sin and remove. There's some hurting people out there. A lot of hurting people. You know, uh, yesterday I was talking to a young lady and I said to her, I said, uh, uh, I said to her, uh, you know, she says, oh, yeah, she was kind of drunk. I won't say kind of drunk. She, oh, she made Jack Daniels look sober. You know, she's like, oh, you know, and she's all talking to me. I said to her, well, you know, aren't you afraid about going to hell? She goes, well, that's just life. I'm going to go to hell. You know, and I said to her, I said, well, you know, I said, ma'am, do you have children? And she goes, yeah, I have children. And I said, I said, well, if something happened to your children, how would that make you feel? She'd go, pretty bad. And I go, you know, you don't have to die to go to hell. You could be living and live in hell. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, you say you don't care if you're going to hell. But then I, just, I said to her, I just heard you tell your children to be careful. Why are you telling your children to be careful if you just don't care? You do care about what happens. You're telling your children to be careful for them and for you because you want the safety of your children. You know, some people they don't have to die to go to hell. People are living in hell today. They are living in hell today. They're living in their bondage. They're living in their prison. They're living in all these things, okay, hell. Today I'm going to talk to you about Matthew chapter 16. And um, it's very important that, as you guys know, we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. But uh, we're going to take, we've taken a little break, okay, because I need to be very sensitive to what the Holy Spirit wants to teach us as a church. Okay? But we will go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. But right now, we're going to talk about first, uh, Matthew chapter 16. In Matthew chapter 16, starting at verse 13, when you got to say amen. 
when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I am? I, the Son of Man, am. Okay? Now, there's something you need to know about Caesarea Philippi is it was, it was surrounded with like statues of all kinds of gods and philosophers. And I mean, it was like, it was like walking into a swap meet of statues. Okay? And Jesus is surrounded by all this type of worship, false worship, false, false idols, false uh, sense of, of security. And imagine this. Imagine Jesus walking in. He's got all his disciples in this town that's known for this, uh, these great you know, statues and all this stuff. And he looks around, and you can imagine, and he tells us, who do people say that I am? Who do people say that the Son of Man am? Amen? Who do people say that I am? Jesus says, they, so they said, who's they? The disciples, right? So the disciples said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Amen? So some say you're John the Baptist, right? Some say, by the way, the Baptist did not come from John the Baptist, FYI, you know. So, I'm Baptist, I'm John the Baptist. Now, Baptist does not mean John the Baptist, all right? So John the Baptist, some say you're John the Baptist. Obviously, John the Baptist, how could I be John the Baptist? They think that, that the spirit of John the Baptist when he died was reincarnated in Christ, okay? So some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. Elijah was a very important element in the Old Testament because it was the, it was the indication of the coming of the Lord. And what they don't realize is they just mix it up. They, understand, they didn't understand that John the Baptist was Elijah in spirit. That, that when they asked him, well, what about Elijah? And he goes, Elijah has already been here. And that is John. And he was indicating, the Bible says, and they, he was indicating uh, that it was John the Baptist. Okay? John. So nonetheless, they, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're John. The, uh, some even say you're Jeremiah. And... One uh, or one of the prophets. Somebody, who are you? You know, these days, there are all kinds of beliefs of who Jesus is. Jesus was a prophet. Jesus was a teacher. Jesus was a philosopher. Jesus was just like Confucius or Buddhist or, or Buddha or any of these guys. That's who Jesus was. He was a good teacher. He was a good man. He was whatever it is. They always want to put Jesus in some form of category, some kind of something. And that's the way the world wants to put Jesus. They don't want to confess who Jesus really is. But Jesus comes to a point, and that point is, who do you say that I am? And he's going to ask him that. Because that's really what it is. It's like, okay, we know what the world thinks of Jesus. If you don't know what the world thinks of Jesus, go out evangelizing with us, and I'll let you know what they think of Jesus. Okay, all right. The world doesn't see our Lord and Jesus Christ as who he is, the Lord, the Christ, son of, son of God, God incarnate, the creator of heaven and earth. They don't see him like that. They see him as something else. They reject him. They want nothing to do with him. Jesus says, who do men say that I am? Well, now he says, who do you say, amen, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the, the what? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. Amen. My father who is in heaven. What did Simon what was revealed to Simon, the son of Barjona? What was revealed to him? That Jesus was the Christ? I mean, there was a lot of people who believed that Jesus was the Christ. There really was. I mean, but what was really, really, really revealed here, a lot of people don't realize, is, is that the Christ is the son of the living God. Okay? The son of the living God. That, that this Christ was the son of God. What? What? I mean, I could believe that Jesus was the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior. But to say he was the Son of God takes Jesus out of the humanity element 
and brings them into the deity element. Amen. It brings it to a point where he is lifting Jesus of more than just a mere man, but God himself. And this is a revelation. This is something that not everyone has. Amen. For example, the Muslims, they believe that Jesus is the Christ. They even call him Messiah. But they don't believe that he is the Son of God because they don't have the revelation from the Father. That's why Jesus makes it very specific. He who believes in the Son knows the Father. But because you don't know the Son, you don't know the Father. For the Father and the Son are one. Does that make sense? That is the greatest revelation of Jesus being the Son of God. There are a lot of people who say that Jesus is not the Son of God, but he's a Son of God, just like we're all sons of God. Like, for example, the Mormons, that Jesus is a Son of God. Okay? Jehovah Witness, that Jesus is a God. You know, the greatest thing, if you look at a lot of the cults, they do one thing, is they separate Jesus' deity, divinity, divinity. They remove it out. They take who Jesus is and they, what they do is they take the Christ, Son of God, and they make him just a mere man, just like you and I, and we could be just like him. They do. As a matter of fact, even among the Christian, even among the Christians, like the UPC, the United Pentecostal, we are little gods. We're all gods. You know? They, what did they do? They not only brought Jesus down, but they lifted us up. We can't do that. There's a revelation, there's something about Jesus that stands out different from all of humanity, all of us that no one, no one can ever replicate, duplicate, or fake. And that is Jesus is the Son of God, the begotten Son of the living God. Begotten, begotten. That is that is the truth that separates all of this world. That is the truth that separates us from them. Is that is Jesus is the son of the living God, begotten. No one can do that. No one can claim that. No one can claim that. But, but Jesus Christ claimed it. This is the revelation. This is the revelation that Jesus says to, to Peter. And, and he says in verse uh, in verse 17, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. See, you can't just get this revelation by intellectual, into using your intellect. It has to be something deeper. But he says what? My Father has revealed this to you. To you. He's revealed it to us. Amen? Then he says, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell or Hades shall not prevail against it. Against it. Wow. What that tells me is that this revelation is so awesome. It is so powerful. It is so mighty that hell itself will not prevail against it. The gates of hell. So what is hell? A lot of people, have, are you talking about the hell fire? Are you talking about death? Are you talking about this? Are you, I'm talking about everything. Everything that God calls the gates of hell, the gates of death. As a matter of fact, um, Jesus says, Jesus says that he is the rock, and it wasn't Peter. Very important to understand that. Number one, that Jesus is the rock. You see, one thing that people have mistaken out there sometimes is that, G that Peter was the rock. He says, you are Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church. Upon this what? The rock. What is the rock? That Jesus is the Son of God. Upon this rock. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10 through 12, it says this, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another build thereon. But let every man take heed how he builds thereon, for, for other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones would stay in hubble or stubble. Okay, so in other words, the foundation that was laid down for us, that rock which God's church is built on, is what? Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, in Psalms chapter 1, I have it on your, in your bulletin if you want to follow along too. Because I'm going to do this pretty quick. 
It says the stone which the builders refuse is become the headstone of the corner. Amen. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. He is the foundation. If you are studying with us in 1 Peter in Bible study, you guys remember who's the cornerstone? Jesus Christ. And we are living stones built upon the cornerstone. The cornerstone is the foundation. It is the rock in which we are built upon. Isaiah chapter 28 verse 16 says, Therefore thus says the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believes in him shall not be ashamed. Amen. In Acts chapter 4, verse, verse 10 through 12, Peter or um, John, while speaking to the people in John chapter 4, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 4, Is that in the New Testament, right? Sorry. <coughs> Acts chapter 4. I had it there. I don't know why I... All right, Acts chapter 4, verse uh, 10 through 12. John speaking says this. He says, Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven and earth among men which, which we must be, what? Saved. So the rock that Jesus is talking about is Jesus Christ. It is not Peter. Jesus Christ is the foundation. That Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Anyone who builds anything else, uh, builds it upon, if they build it on gold, on silver, on hay, so it's nothing, it will burn up. But the foundation that stands, and it will stand for all eternity, is the foundation that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. This is the God whom we serve. This is the God in whom we believe in. Amen? What else? He says about this rock, he says, I will build my church. My church. What is he talking about? A building, a, a, a temple. A, what is he talking about? Who's the church? His people. I will build my church on this foundation that I am Jesus the Christ, Son of the living God, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. Amen? Against it. What is the gates of hell? We learn in Psalms chapter 9, verse 13. It says, Have mercy upon me, O Lord. Consider my trouble which I suffer of them that hate me. Thou that lifts me up from the gates of death. Amen? In Job chapter 38, I'm going to be kind of quick, okay, guys? Just so it's right there in your bulletins. I printed it out for you just so you can have it nice and easy, all right? Believe me, it is in your Bible. If you want to double check me, <coughs> you're like, I, gotta, I don't care if it's in my bulletin. I need to see it right here. That's fine. Job chapter 38, verse 16 through 17. By the time you get to it, we'll probably be out of service, right? Job, Job 38, 16, 17. It's Job, J-O-B. Sounds like a job. Some of you ripped that out of your Bibles already. <laughs> thou has thou, hast thou entered into the springs of the sea? Or has thou walked in the search of the depth? Have the gates of death been open unto thee? Or has thou seen the doors of the shadow of death. Death, the gates of hell, has always been used as to mean anything like hell, like, like the gates of your enemies, the gates of death, the grave, the gates of the, the grave, meaning, the, meaning uh, uh, death itself. Death itself. Jesus says that what? Death itself will not have victory over God's people if they believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen? And, and this is the faith we have. The Bible says, as a matter of fact, when we believe in Jesus Christ, we have passed from death unto life. From darkness into light. 
God has transformed us, taken us out of darkness and put us into the kingdom of his son. Death will not have victory over us. Why? Jesus Christ had victory over it. When did that happen? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And when you got to say amen. says this in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the oh, I heard I thought I knew Mike's gonna be yelling that one out for the trumpet will sound and the dead be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality so when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your? O oh, hell, where is your? That's right. Or Hades, where is your victory? Why? Where's your victory, O oh, hell? Where's your victory, O oh, Hades? Why? Because the Son of God has given victory. The gates of hell will not prevail over God's people. God has given victory over it. Amen. The sting of death is sin, and the law of the strength is, or the law, the, the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the what? Turn here and say, You got victory. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through our Lord what? Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Hallelujah. Why is it not in vain? Because God has given you victory. He's given you ability to conquer death's, death, your enemies. He's given you the victory over all these things. That's why the Apostle Paul says, we are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. More than conquerors. We not only conquer, our, our sin hasn't only been conquered through the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but everything else that pertains to this life and the life hereafter. God has given us victory. That's something to be proud of. That's something to rejoice about. That's something to say, man, I don't care what comes my way. I know there's a God who has given me victory. Not will give me victory, has given me victory. Big difference. We live in a state of victory. Even though there we go through battles, we go through hard times, we get hit, we get this, we get that, we get knocked out, knocked down, knocked out, whatever it is, God gives us victory over these things. Why? Because the promise is when we trust in Him, we are not put to shame. We trust in Him. We trust in Him. You know, sometimes, you know, I think it's, it's awesome because the one thing the one thing we have problems with, church, is the fact that sometimes we don't want to be so bold about Jesus Christ. We don't want to say things in our life about Jesus or about the victory he's given to us. And the reason why is because we're afraid that we might be ashamed. We're afraid that maybe what we're saying is, is going to, uh, uh, people are going to go, ah, yeah, look at you, you know, that type of thing. So we're afraid. We're afraid to say, you know what? God is going to do such and such. Sometimes we're afraid by, to say that. Instead, you know what we say? Oh, you know, whatever. God's will happens. You know? We're afraid to be bold for Christ. We're afraid to, to step out. You know? To step out of the, the water. You heard the song? We're afraid because the waves are like, oh, you're going to step out? Come on out. I'm going to drown you. And we're like, oh. So we, we, like, we want one foot in the, in the boat and one foot out. And we're like, really? We do. That's what we do because we're, we're, we're afraid. We're, we, we're not sure what, what's happening out there. You know, we're, we got that fear. But, you know, Jesus says, he who trusts in me will not be put to shame, will not be ashamed. You will not be ashamed. So it's okay to be bold for the Lord. And listen, I'm not talking about being bold like going out there and preach. I'm bold. 
you know that's not what i'm talking about i'm talking about the things in your life that you struggle with those those internal battles that you fight inside there it's okay to say god i i believe i believe you're going to give me victory over what i'm thinking or what i'm going through or what's happening in my life i'm a, you know we we sometimes hesitate to say that or to proclaim that in our life because we're afraid that we might be wrong we might be wrong. And listen, here's the, po- here's the whole thing is, is if you declare God's victory in your life, I know that God is going to get me through whatever it is. God's going to give me the victory. I may not know how it comes or what it is, but God's going to give me victory in this. God will never put you to shame. Why? Because you trust in him. You trust in him. You see, God's on time. God's on time. Maybe not our timing, but God's on time. He knows what to do, he knows when to do it, and he knows how to do it. He knows it. It's his timing. We are horrible in timing. We are, believe me, I know I am. But thanks be to God that God knows how to sometimes, sometimes pull my, actually all the time, it's just me listening to pull those rings, and I'm like, uh, uh, uh. and all I say, God, thank you. Hold me back. Hold me back, God. Hold me back. Amen. We got to trust in Him. He, he says in the promises, He who believes it is this rock that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen. And then He says to, then He says to uh, Peter and to really to all of to well to Peter in this case and to all of us, He says. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. We have the keys, folks. We have the keys to the kingdom of heaven. We have the keys that brings eternal life. Peter was given the key and that key was used in Acts chapter 2. You see, in the day of Pentecost, when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter went out and he started preaching the gospel. And when, when he started preaching the very first sermon of the death, burial, and resurrection is in Acts chapter 2. When he started preaching the gospel, people were turned. God, what Peter did is he took God's keys that he gave him and he opened it up and he opened up the kingdom of the gospel. If you really want to know how to preach the gospel, Acts chapter 2, the very first sermon, is probably one of the best. You always start with the old stuff. Oh, well, you know, this is this, 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 this. And you talk about the law and you talk about the sin. Then you go into, hey, I got good news, though. Amen? Because it always starts that way. You know, it's always got to be bad news first and then good news. Oh. And that's how sometimes we come to realize we need Christ. I mean, the truth is, folks, really, the truth is, if you think about it, there's a lot of things that you would not do unless someone told you that you had to do them. What I mean by that is you go to the doctor and he says to you, hey, your cholesterol level is way up. In other words, if you don't cut it out, you're going to die soon. So I need you to start exercising and start going on a diet. It's going to take a doctor to tell you that. Amen? So sometimes some things we will not do unless someone pushed us or forced us to do it. I mean, that's just the way it is sometimes. Amen? We've got to be, we've got to understand that the bad news lets us come to realize that there is good news. The bad news that we were sinners, that we have failed God, has brought us to a point of saying, you know what, God, I want to now serve you and do what you want me to do because I understand I come to realize we now because we have all all of us here has received the gospel of Jesus Christ we should not live in defeat we should not live in a in a in a state of 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 just like oh we got victory in Christ whatever battles you're going through you will win you will win you will win It may not be exactly the way you want it. Really. Amen. But you will win. 
all things work together for good to those who love God. Amen. Folks, if we believe that to be the word of God, then we have to believe God said it, and if God said it, it happens. So if all things work together for good to those who love God, and the only condition is whether or not I love God, well, I do love God. And if you love me, he says you obey me, and I do obey you, then that all works together. Does that make sense? It all works together. We serve a mighty God who's given us victory. Amen? A victory, the rock of ages, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the creator of heaven and earth, the chief cornerstone, our foundation, which we stand upon, are built upon. We put everything upon it, our family, our home, everything about it, our church, our fellowship, everything is built on Christ. And if it's built on Christ, if it's built on Christ, nothing can touch it. Nothing can touch it. So let, that fa- let your life, let that foundation be Christ in your life. Keep it all in that. When you came to believe, you said, Lord, here's your, Lord, I'm here, God. But you know what? I believe. And you put yourself on higher ground, on the foundation of Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Father, we love you, Lord. We thank you so much for your grace, your peace, your strength. We thank you, God, for the victory you gave to us, Lord. The victory you've shown us through your word, Father God, which says that the gates of hell will not prevail. We thank you, God, for the keys you've given to us, Lord. It is the gospel that saves people from death and brings them to life. Allow us, Lord God, and show us your ways, your truth, your peace, Lord, in our lives. Let us be reminded over and over and over again, Lord. Let us be reminded that we have victory in you and through you, Lord. Father God, when the enemy tries to remind us of our past, help us to remind him of his future. Father God, that we have the victory and that our failures and all these things of the past are no longer, but sin has been defeated at the cross. And we stand in your victory, Lord. We thank you. We love you and we worship you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And all the saints of God say, amen and amen. Well, God is good. And all the time? Uh, amen and amen. And Ma- uh, Matthew, is that you back there? Matthew is here from, where are you from again? North Carolina, right? North Carolina. So Matthew is one of the, God bless you, Matthew. Good to see you, brother. And uh, welcome you here in Arizona. And uh, thank you for going out there and preaching the gospel. Thank you, and, and we thank others and what God is doing. Amen. Thank you so much. Hallelujah. We serve a mighty God. Amen. Um, Prot Luck will, uh, after go, will, will resume, or lunch after service will resume next week. We'll be having Pot Luck. I want to thank you, first of all, all those who have uh, volunteered to take people to and from the airport and traveling. Thank you guys so much. Um, I know the schedule is kind of crazy. Yesterday, due to rain and all these things, you know, but, but it's nice outside. So uh, there's going to be people who are going to be leaving here from like 12 to like 6 to the airport. They need rides to the airport and back. Um, uh, Rick Skeens, everyone know Rick? Remember Rick? Rick is uh, uh, one of the transportation guys, so him and I are just kind of stay in touch. I told him I'm kind of out until 1230. Um, so uh, if you can volunteer to, to uh, be a driver, I know Deacon Carey has volunteered, uh, Deacon, uh, Frank up there volunteered. Uh, if you are a driver uh, and you are able to, uh, whether or not you want to hang around this area or be on call, what happens is there are people who are in downtown Phoenix and they're down there and their flight like takes off at like, oh, I got, my flight takes off at 2. So what they do is they call somebody, we take their luggage from here, we pick them up downtown, and then we take them to the airport. So some people's flights are at 2, some are at 3.30, some are at 5, some are at 4, 5.30, some are at, you know what I mean? That type of thing. So they try their best to kind of lump them up as much as possible, but we kind of want to stay on call. And then not only that, but um, there comes a time when all of them come in at what time? Did they tell you what time they're done? Matthew, did they say anything like 5.30, 6? Oh, until 4.30? Okay, 
So then what happens is uh, at about that, they start going around picking up, pe picking up people at the stop at 4, 4.30, or 4.35, 5.36, something like that. So um, transportation is, is important. So if you are able to drive or to transport people, great. If not, we'll find drivers. We have us and we have a few others who are driving. Amen? Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you, God. And I ask you, Lord God, that you bless those who are here, God. Father God, use them in a mighty way, Father God. And if there's any who are lost who need to know you, God, bring them into your fold, Lord. Let them come to realize and see the love that you have for them, God. Father God, the prodigal children, Lord, bring them back, God. Father God, bless those who are here, God. Use them in a mighty way. Bless their families, their homes, their children, their work, their finances. Use them, Father God, so that you, they glorify you.